Our sermon passage this morning is found in Genesis chapters 41 and, or 40 and 41, excuse me. So the first book of the Bible, chapters 40 and 41. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he, at and he attended them. They continued for some time in custody. And one night, they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers, who were with him in custody in his master's house, why are, why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, we have had dreams, and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So the chief cupbearer told him his dream to Joseph and said to him, in the dream there was a vine before me, and on the vine there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, this is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift your head and restore you to your office. And you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me when it is well with you. And please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh. And so get me out of this house." For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head, and the uppermost basket, in the uppermost basket there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, and the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat the flesh from you. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hands, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile, and behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came out of the Nile after them, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive, plump cows, and Pharaoh awoke. He fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on the stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump, full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So in the morning, his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today when Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in the, and the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard. We dreamed on the same night, he and I, each having a dream with its own interpretation. A young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. When we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, having an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And as he interpreted to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office, and the baker was hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. 
Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I was standing on the banks of the Nile. Seven cows, plump and attractive, came out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and thin, just as I had never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the thin, ugly cows ate up the first seven plump cows. But when they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were still as ugly as at the beginning. Then I awoke, and I also saw in my dream... Seven ears growing on one stalk, full and good. Seven ears withered, thin and blighted by the east wind, sprouted after them. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears. And I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven good years, are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, but after there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land." The famine will consume the land, and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow, for it will be very severe. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over all the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming up and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt, so that the land may not perish through the famine. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants, and Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command." Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him ride in his second chariot and they called out before him, Bow the knee. Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name zephanath Peniah, and he gave him in marriage Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. So Joseph went over the land of Egypt, went out over the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered into the service of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. During the seven plentiful years, the earth produced abundantly. Then he gathered up all the food in those seven years, which occurred in the land of Egypt, and put the food in the cities. He put in every city the food from the fields around it. And Joseph stored up grain in great abundance, like the sand of the sea, until he ceased to measure it, for it could not be measured. Before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph. Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore to him. Um, Joseph called the the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. The name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. The seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end, and all and the seven years of famine began to come as Jesus, as not Jesus. Joseph has said, There was famine in all lands, and in all the land of Egypt there was bread. When the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried out to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to the Egyptians, Go to Joseph, what he says to you do. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain, because the famine was severe over all the earth. 
Well, Anna, thank you. Um, my wife may have leaned over to me in the middle of your reading and lovingly rebuked me um, for asking you to read and asking if I was trying to make you go into labor. Um, and so, rebuke taken. Um, but if that's the case, praise God. Um, well, um, we are nearing the end um, of our sermon series in the book of Genesis. Um, obviously, we have two um, big, long chapters here this morning, but after this morning, we'll, we're going to have nine um, chapters left. And so we're, we're getting to the finish line uh, slowly, but surely this has been a, um, a journey, a, a marathon, but I hope it's been a, a good one um, during our, our time in Genesis. But we're not, we're not done uh, this morning. We are in chapter 40 and, and 41 here uh, this morning. And so we come to these two chapters this morning. These chapters are going to be especially relevant and applicable for four groups of people, four different types of people, four different groups of people that are here this morning. And I would guess that everybody here in, in some capacity falls within one of these four groups and, and probably multiple groups. And so first, these chapters are going to be especially relevant to those who, who feel like they've been forgotten. Those who might be here this morning and feel like they're, they're overlooked, to, who, who feel like they're not remembered. Like anybody here can, can relate to that? Maybe, maybe as a parent, maybe as a child, maybe... Maybe as a friend, maybe, maybe as a, a church or a church member, or church pastors, or maybe somebody in your life that you feel like has forgotten you, that you, you just don't feel like you, you're, you're remembered. You feel like, you've been, you feel like you've been forgotten. Second, these chapters are going to be relevant, especially ap applicable for those who feel like your life is just spinning out of control. Like your life's just spinning out of control, just feel like there's been one thing after another, after another, after another, after another, after another happen in your life and just your head's spinning and you feel like your life's spinning out of control and the situations and the events and the circumstances of your life are just spinning out of control, just chaos as well. Third, this passage is going to be especially relevant and applicable for those who, who are just in desperate need of wisdom. You just need wisdom. You, you need discernment. There are things you're, you're facing in your life, situations, events, and you're looking at them, and you're like, I, I don't know what to do, or I think I need to do this, or this seems like the right thing to do, and you just, you just, need, just need wisdom. And fourth, and, and finally, this passage, these chapters are going to be especially relevant for those who are here this morning, and you're not a Christian. You're, you're, you're not a Christian. Okay, if, if that's you this morning, then, then I've, been, I've been praying especially for you this morning, that in this passage that you would see just the hope that's available to you and the salvation that's available to you as well. So then these are, are four groups of people, four types of people that believe these chapters are going to be especially relevant to, applicable to, that if you're here this morning and feel forgotten these passage. In this chapter, these chapters are going to remind you that you, you, you haven't been forgotten. If you're here this morning, you feel like your life is spinning out of control, these chapters are going to remind you that, no, your life is, is in perfect control. If you're here this morning, you're in desperate need of wisdom, that this passage is going to point you to the true source of wisdom. And if you're here this morning, you're not a Christian, then this passage is going to point you to where you can find hope and where you can find salvation here this morning. And so then let's, let's jump in. Got a lot to cover here. Not going to be able to read through and address every single issue and, and verse within these two chapters here this morning. But let's jump into them this morning. Let's, let's begin this passage. These chapters begin with focusing on the first group that I mentioned. Those who feel like you've been forgotten. That for those who feel like you've been forgotten, this, this first chapter, chapter 40, is going to remind us that Jesus hasn't forgotten you. So then remember the context real quick and, and just where we are in the book of Genesis. If you remember, we're in this final section of the book of Genesis that's all about Jacob's sons. 
And it's specifically about Jacob's 11th son, a son by the name of Joseph. And this section, if you remember, began all the way back in in chapter 37 with Joseph's brothers becoming jealous of Joseph and therefore selling him off into slavery. And as he was sold off into slavery, he was taken to the land of Egypt. And while he's in Egypt, things get worse. And you're like, how can they get worse than being sold into slavery? Well, he sold a second time. He sold a second time. And this time he sold to a man by the name of Potiphar. And after he was sold to Potiphar, then things get even worse than, than being sold for a second time into slavery. Potiphar's wife frames Joseph and falsely accuses, accuses him of raping her and therefore has him thrown into prison. And that's where we pick off up now here in chapter 40. Joseph's in prison. And while he's in prison, look what happens next. We see it in chapter 40, starting in verse 1. It says, sometime after this, after he, he was placed in prison, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against the Lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them. They continued for some time in custody. So then at the end of chapter 39, we see Joseph in prison. And at the beginning of chapter 40, we notice and see that Joseph's not in prison alone. Instead, two of of Pharaoh's closest closest advisors, two of his chief officers are there with him, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And when you initially read that, you think, okay, the kitchen help is in prison with, with, with Joseph, or the kitchen staff is in prison with Joseph. Well, the reality is these two men, the chief cupbearer and the, and the chief baker, they're a whole lot more than just the kitchen staff. They're a whole lot more than just the kitchen help. And so these two men are, are um, two of Pharaoh's most trusted advisors um, for Pharaoh. The, the chief cupbearer, he was responsible for making sure no one poisoned Pharaoh's drink. And the chief cupbearer was responsible for no one um, sabotaging and and um, poisoning Pharaoh's food. And so these are some pretty significant men who are overseeing this entire operation, kind of like the the secret service, if you want to think about it that way, who are responsible to make sure that no one kills Pharaoh, no one kills the king. And so that's what these two, the chief cupbearer and the, the baker were ultimately responsible for. And we're not told exactly how, but somehow... These two men end up in prison. And while they're in prison, they both have dreams. The only problem is no one is there to be able to interpret their dreams. There were these dream experts, these dream, these individuals like magicians and wise men who were, who were trained in that day to be, able, to be able to interpret dreams. Well, they weren't in prison with the cupbearer and the baker. And so they look around and they're troubled because they have these dreams, but no one's there who can interpret their dreams for them. And so then they they tell Joseph their dreams. And lo and behold, guess what Joseph does? He begins to interpret their dreams for them. And he first begins to interpret the dream of the chief cupbearer. And we see this in verse 12 and 13. Look there with me. It says, Then Joseph said to him, the cupbearer, This is its interpretation, meaning your dream's interpretation. The three branches are three days, and in three days Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. And so then this is the meaning of of the cupbearer's dream here. That in three days Pharaoh, the king, is going to lift up the cupbearer's head meaning he's going to release him from prison and he's going to restore him back to his office in his position of cupbearer. So then that's the interpretation, Joseph's interpretation of of the cupbearer's dream. But after he interprets the the cupbearer's dream, Joseph has one little tiny request for the cupbearer. And we see his request there in verse 14. 
Look there with me. Joseph asked the cupbearer this. He says, only remember me when it is well with you. And please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh. And so get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews. And here also I've done nothing that they should put me into the pit. And so they see what Joseph's asking here? That when the chief cupbearer is released from prison, Joseph is begging and pleading and asking the cupbearer to do one thing, to remember him, to remember him, to not forget him. But instead, when he gets out of prison, he wants him to remember him, to not forget him, to tell Pharaoh about him. So Pharaoh will come and, and release Joseph from prison too. So then you can imagine what's going on in the baker's mind at this point in time. He hears Joseph's favorable interpretation of the cupbearer's dream, and the baker's like all giddy and excited, and he's like, okay, now, now Joseph, tell me, tell me the meaning of, of my dream. And he's excited because he's, he knows it's going to be good because the, interpre the interpretation of cupbearer's dream was good. And so Baker's all excited because he's excited about what this is going to mean for him and how he's going to be released from prison too. The only problem, though, is the meaning of the baker's dream is the complete opposite meaning and interpretation of the cupbearer's dream. So look at Joseph's interpretation of the baker's dream. We see it in verse 18 and verse 19. Verse 18, Joseph says to the baker, this is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days, and in three days Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat the flesh from you. And so then whereas Pharaoh is going to lift up the cupbearer's head and restore him back to his office, that's not going to be the case for the baker. Like, like Pharaoh's going to lift up his, the baker's head all right, but it's not to lift up his head in order to release him from prison and, and restore him back to his previous office and position. Instead, he's going to lift up his head in order to snap it. He's going to lift up his head in order to, to hang him on a tree and kill him. And that's exactly what happens in verses 20 through 23. That Pharaoh does exactly like what Joseph said was going to happen. That Pharaoh lifts the cupbearer's head up and restores him back to his position, and he lifts the baker's head up so that he can hang him on a tree and kill him, just as Joseph interpreted and said would happen. The one thing that doesn't happen, though, is that the cupbearer doesn't do what Joseph asked him to do. Do you remember what Joseph asked the cupbearer to do? After he interpreted his dream, he asked him that when he gets out of prison and is released from prison, he only asked him to do one thing. Remember me. Don't, don't, don't forget about me. Re remember me. But look at how chapter 40 closes in verse 23. It closes with these words. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. That's how the chapter ends. The, the chapter ends not only with Joseph still in prison, but with Joseph being completely forgotten and not remembered. And so I wonder this morning, if there's anybody here this morning that can resonate and relate to Joseph here. That like Joseph, you've been forgotten. That like Joseph, you feel forgotten. That like Joseph, others haven't remembered you. Maybe you feel forgotten by a parent who just neglected you, forgot you, didn't remember you. May you feel neglected by, by a child. May you feel neglected or, or forgotten or, or not remembered by, by a friend or a fellow church member that they haven't remembered you, they, they've forgotten you, you feel overlooked, you feel forgotten. Like if that's, if that's you this morning, if you can relate to all of this this morning, then I want you to remember this, that this scene that we just read about, that we saw in chapter 40 here, this scene is replayed later on in the Bible. That later on in the Bible, we're going to see another innocent man 
suffering unjustly between two criminals. And of these two criminals, one is going to be rescued and released, and the other criminal is going to die, just like the cupbearer and the baker here. And do you remember what the criminal that's released asked the innocent man, Jesus? He asked him to remember me. And do you remember what Jesus does? He remembers him. He doesn't forget him. He remembers him and promises him that today you will be with me in paradise. And this right here, and how this story points to that, this right here is the hope and the comfort that we have as Christians. That if you're a Christian here this morning, it might feel like everyone else has forgotten you and that no one else remembers you. But the reality is that's not true because Jesus does. He remembers you. Yes, it's true that your friends, your family, your church, your classmates may have forgotten you and not remembered you, but because of the cross, Jesus will always remember you and never forget you. Which then leads to how this passage applies and is relevant to the second group of people that I mentioned. And that second group of people are those who feel like their life is just spinning out of control. For those who feel like your life is spinning out of control, chapter 41 is going to remind you that, that God is in complete control. He's in complete control of your life. We see this starting in verse 1 of, of chapter 41. Look there with me. It says this. After two whole years, so after the events in chapter 40, two years after that, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile, and behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up, like just picture this in your mind, right? Ate up the seven attractive, plump cows. And Pharaoh awoke, and he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven years of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump, full ears, and Pharaoh, Pharaoh awoke. And behold, it was a dream. So in the morning his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. So in chapter 40, the cupbearer and the baker have, have dreams. And now in chapter 41, Pharaoh's going to have a pair of dreams himself. And just like the, the cupbearer and the baker were troubled by their dreams, so Pharaoh here is troubled by his dreams because just like the cupbearer and the baker, there's no one there to interpret or no one able to interpret his dreams either. And so then, when the cupbearer sees how troubled Pharaoh is because no one's able to interpret his dreams, the cupbearer's like, hey, I know a guy. I, I know a guy who can interpret dreams. Let me, let, me go, let me go find him and bring him to you. And so then that's what happens next in, in verses 14 through 24 here. Pharaoh sends for Joseph and tells Joseph the, the weird dreams that he just had about these seven ugly cows eating these seven plump cows and these seven thin ears of grain swallowing up these seven good ears of grain, but how no one's able, the magicians, the wise men, all these dream interpreters and experts, no one's able to interpret these dreams. And so then in verse 25, Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams for him. And here's the interpretation. We see it in verse 25. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what, is about, what, what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. 
There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, but after then there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land, and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow, for it will be very severe. Verse 32, and the doubling of Pharaoh's dreams means that the thing is fixed by God, and God will, short, God will shortly bring it about. And so then that's the meaning of Pharaoh's dreams here. The seven plump cows and the seven good ears of, of grain are symbolic of the seven years of abundance that, is, that, that Egypt is about to have and experience. While the seven ugly cows and the seven thin ears of grain are symbolic of the seven years of famine that are going to come up, that are going to come upon Egypt and swallow the seven years of abundance. And so that's the, that's the meaning of Pharaoh's dreams here and how Joseph interprets them about what's about what's about to happen, what's to come. But in the midst of all these dreams and the midst of the interpretation of these dreams here, there are three really, really important things that are important for us, the reader, to catch and to see about these dreams and the interpretation of these dreams and what's about to happen next. And the first thing we need to notice is this, is that only God can reveal the meaning of these dreams. Like, it's the point here. The magicians can't, the wise men can't, Pharaoh can't. Only God can reveal the interpretation, the meaning of these dreams. Second, when it comes to the fulfillment of these dreams, God isn't just looking into the future to see how these dreams ultimately play out or looking into the future to see how these dreams are ultimately going to be fulfilled. That's not what's going on here. Instead, God's going to fulfill them himself. In other words, God's disclosed these dreams to show what he's going to do. God himself is going to make these dreams happen. The fulfillment of these dreams happen. He's going to bring them about himself. In other words, he's going to do it. And Joseph like knows that. That's why in verse 25, look there with me. Joseph says, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh, here it comes, what he is about to do. We see the same thing in verse 28. Joseph says, it is it is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. We see the same thing at the very end of verse 32. It says, God will short, shortly bring it about. Like God's going to do all this. Like Joseph wants Pharaoh to know that everything that is about to happen is God's doing. The seven years of abundance, God's going to do that. The seven years of famine, God's going to do that. God's going to bring about both of them. It's all his doing. It's all, it's all from God. Third then, thing we need to see here and notice is that it's important that we see that what God's about to do, and it's, he's, he's the one who's going to do it, it's fixed. It's fixed. It's already determined. It, it's unchanging. Like it's, it's going to happen. In other words, when you read through the, the Joseph story here, ha, have you ever wondered why so many of the dreams come in pairs? Especially, like, why they come in twos? Like, do you notice that? Like, it's all over the place. Like, why are there two dreams when they basically mean the same thing? We saw this all the way back in chapter 37. Remember that? Joseph had two dreams about how his brothers are going to bow down before him. In chapter 40, the cupbearer and the baker have two dreams. And here in chapter 41, Pharaoh has two dreams. So then what's the big, what's, what's going on here with these two dream things? Like, why, why are they all coming to pairs? Why are, they, why are they coming in twos? Especially since most of these dreams just mean the exact same thing. Well, Joseph tells us in verse 32, look there with me. He says, in the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God. 
And so then that's, that's the purpose of these dreams coming in twos or coming in pairs. It's because these dreams function as two witnesses who confirm the certainty of something, who confirm the certainty that these dreams and the meaning of these dreams are going to happen. They're going to come true. They're, in other words, they're repeated twice in different ways to confirm that they're absolutely fixed. It's already been decided by God. What's going to happen? Again, in other words, it's going to happen. There's no stopping this. Pharaoh's not going to be able to stop it. The weather's not going to stop it. Joseph's not going to be able to stop it. It's fixed. It's determined by God. And he's going to be the one that brings it about. In other words, he, he's not just up there reacting to things as they play out. Oh, he's in prison now. Okay, I better do this. Oh, there's famine now. I better do this. Uh, that's not what's going on here. Instead, he's already determined. He's already fixed what's going to happen. He's already determined what's going to take place. And then he's going to carry it out and do it to make sure it's done. And so then I understand. Hear this, please. I get and understand the questions that some of this raises. And they're good questions. They're questions that need to be asked, but questions I don't have time to answer at this moment. But I hope you also see in the midst of these questions, the comfort and the peace that the reality that should bring as well. In other words, your life right now might be really hard. Like you might right now be walking through like your, your own famine right now or your own prison right now. But even if it's hard, you can take great comfort in knowing this. Your life's not spinning out of control. It's not out of control in any way, shape, or form. Instead, as chaotic and out of control as things feel and as things might appear right now, they're really not. Instead, everything in your life right now is playing out according to God's fixed plan and predetermined purpose for your life. That includes the good, that includes the bad, and that includes the ugly. And as a result of that, then you can rest, you can rest in God's sovereign plan and purpose for your life, and you can trust him. Like he's not up there just anxious, like what's going to happen next? If this happens, then how am I going to fix that? And he, he's, he's not fretting at all. Instead, he's got everything in complete, perfect control and has a good plan and purpose for everything that is happening in your life. Which then leads to the third group, those who are in desperate need of, of wisdom and how this passage is applicable and relevant for those who are in desperate need of wisdom. That for those who are in need of, of wisdom, this passage reminds us that Jesus is, is our wisdom. Jesus is your wisdom. And this is what we see next, starting in verse 33. Look at verse 33 with me. Remember the context real quick. Joseph had just explained to Pharaoh the meaning of his dreams and, and, and interpreted his dreams for Pharaoh. And then right after that, he shares with Pharaoh a plan. Joseph shares with Pharaoh a, a proposal for how to save Egypt from the famine that's about to happen. And we see his plan there starting in verse 33. Look there with me. Here's, here's, here's Joseph's plan that he tells Pharaoh, his proposal for how to rescue and save Egypt from the famine that's about to come. Verse 33. Now, therefore, this is Joseph speaking here, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are occur in the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish through the famine. So you see Joseph's kind of plan here, right? This is his plan. There's a famine coming and he's telling him in advance, hey, I got a proposal, I got a plan, I got an idea. 
And this plan basically involves Pharaoh looking out and figuring out who the wisest, most discerning man is in all of Egypt to oversee this famine and relief project. And then for that man, whoever that wise, discerning man is going to be, to have all these different overseers underneath him who would take 20% of everyone's produce of land during the seven years of abundance so that they could store it away and have it available to hand out and distribute when the famine hits. Look then at how Pharaoh responds when he hears Joseph's plan and proposal. We see his response there in verse 37. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this? And whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, (laughs) there is no one so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. We do this at church a lot. Like somebody comes to us as as elders with an idea, with a plan of of ministry. We're like, hey, you came up with it, you get to do it, you know? And so be careful um, what ideas you come up with. But uh, it's biblical, right? Um, But that's, that's, that's that's what Pharaoh does here. Joseph comes up with this plan. And Pharaoh's like, sounds great. You're the man. You, you do it. And it proceeds then to, to appoint and place Joseph as the second most powerful person. The second most powerful person in all the land of Egypt. The second in command over the famine relief efforts in Egypt. But the point we need to see here is why Pharaoh appointed Joseph to this high and lofty position. Like, why, why, why Joseph? Why, why do you appoint him? Well, he appoints him there because in verse 39, he says there's no one as wise and discerning as Joseph. And as it goes back to verse 33, when Joseph tells Pharaoh, find somebody who's wise and discerning. And Pharaoh's like, there's no one as wise and discerning as you. And that makes sense, right? Pharaoh has watched Joseph. He's watched Joseph not only interpret his dreams that no one and all the dream experts, they couldn't interpret them, but Joseph could. And not only that, but he listened to Joseph's plan for how in the world they're going to survive and this, this famine that's about to come. And so when Pharaoh sees all this and listens and all this from Joseph, he's like, man, there's something different about you. And he recognizes that the only reason and the thing that's different about Joseph is that he's wiser and more discerning than than anybody else. And he recognizes that the reason that he's wiser and more discerning than everybody else is because the Spirit of God has made him that way. And so then, here you have a man that the Spirit has given wisdom to in order to save and rescue the world from death. And this man Joseph here, this wise and discerning man Joseph here, is meant to point forward to another man that the Spirit came upon and that had wisdom and who saved the world from death. And that other man is none other than Jesus. Like if you remember, when Jesus was baptized, the the Spirit came upon Jesus like a dove. And then later on in, in Luke, Luke 11 tells us that Jesus possessed more wisdom than even Solomon. Later on in Paul's writings in Colossians 2 verse 3, Paul says that all of God's wisdom is hidden in Jesus. Later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, and 1 Corinthians 1, chapter, or verse 30, Paul refers to Jesus as, as the wisdom of God. Meaning Jesus, just wrap your mind around this, Jesus is wisdom, God's wisdom in the flesh. Jesus is the perfect embodiment of God's wisdom. 
Jesus is the, the, the perfect embodiment of God's wisdom, and he's the one that, that Joseph here is ultimately pointing to. And so then think about this. If you're here this morning, and you're facing like your own famine in your own life, and you're like, man, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to respond to this? This is hard. Can't make sense of all that's going on here. What do I do? How do I respond? Well, the answer is do what Pharaoh did. Find the wisest, most discerning person you know and listen to him. And guess what? I got an idea who that person is. It's Jesus. And so no matter where you are and what you're going through, listen to him. Follow him. Look to him. Let him be your wisdom. Trust in his wisdom. Follow his wisdom. Whatever you're wor working through and wrestling through and walking through right now. But even when I say that, this is the rub, isn't it? Like, let's be honest, th this right here is the rub. That instead of following and listening to Jesus and listening to his wisdom and following his wisdom, so often we want to seek after wisdom in other ways and in our own way, right? And do you know why we want to do that? And why that's the natural impulse in our hearts and in our lives? It's because it's been that way from the very beginning. It's been that way all the way back to the garden. That rather than trust God's wisdom, what did the woman do? The woman sought after wisdom her own way, not God's way. And then, then she ate from the tree because she thought it would make her wise. And as a result, the results of that were disastrous and deadly. And they're still felt today. But the reality is, if we're not careful, we can do the exact same thing. That as parents, instead of trusting God's wisdom and Jesus' wisdom on how to parent our kids, we can seek after the world's wisdom or use our own wisdom or seek after others' wisdoms, even if they mean right. Or when it comes to marriage or singleness or our jobs or anything else, instead of trusting God's wisdom, we can seek after the world's wisdom, use our own wisdom, seek after others' wisdom. This is true for just about every area of our lives. And so then ask yourself, in what areas of my life am I pursuing my own wisdom? Am I pursuing wisdom my own way rather than seeking after God's wisdom and letting the Spirit of God be the one that instructs me and gives me wisdom and listening to Jesus' wisdom and following Jesus' wisdom instead of seeking after, your, after wisdom in your, in your own way? This then leads to this last and, and final group that this passage is relevant and applicable for. And that's for those of you who are here this morning and you're not a Christian. Like if you're here this morning, you're not a Christian, you might be wondering, well, how in the world are these two chapters relevant and applicable for me? Well, they're relevant and applicable in this way. That these, these chapters here, these chapters here, this story here reminds you and lets you know but if you're here this morning, you're not a Christian, that Jesus can save you and that Jesus can rescue you. It's so what we see. This is the point of, of the last few verses that we're going to see here, starting in verse 40 through the rest, end of the chapter in verse 57. Then in verses 33 through 39, um, if you remember, Pharaoh sees just how discerning and, and wise that Joseph is. And he sees how the Spirit of God has, has rested upon Joseph and given Joseph all this wisdom. And so then as a result, Pharaoh then exalts Joseph to be the second in command, the, the second most powerful person in all of Egypt. And we talked about this just briefly for just a moment, but look at what Pharaoh tells Joseph in verse 40. Look at verse 40. He tells him, you shall be over my house and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I've set you over all the land of Egypt. Again, he appoints him as the second most powerful person in all of Egypt. He appoints him as the second in command. 
And then in verse 42, Pharaoh has this public installation service in which he installs Joseph as his second in command. And here's what happens as, at, his, at this installation service. We see it in verse 42. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck and made him ride in his second chariot. And they called out before him, bow the knee. Thus he set him, Joseph, over all the land of Egypt. More Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And so in this installation service, Pharaoh basically dresses Joseph up as a king. He's an image, a representative of, a, of, of the king. He dresses up, up in all this royal garb in order to, to signify his new exalted position. In verse 46 through 55 then, um, Joseph's interpretation of Pharaoh's dream becomes a reality. Egypt experiences seven years of abundance. Then they experience seven years of famine. And, and when the famine hits, then everybody in the land follows Joseph's instructions, follows his plan and his proposal. They store up a whole bunch of food for when the famine hits. And then after the seven years of abundance, um, yeah, there's this, there's this famine. And, and this famine wasn't just in Egypt, but it was, all, it was all throughout the entire earth and throughout the whole world as well. And as a result, when the famine hits, here's what happened next. We see it in verse 56. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain, because the famine was severe over all the earth. So then, these chapters here, this story here is, is one of the greatest rags to riches story that the world has ever seen. Just think about it. Joseph has gone from hated brother to Egyptian slave to prisoner to the second most powerful person in the land of Egypt. He's gone from, from the prison to a palace. He's gone from a prisoner to a prince. He's gone from dissension to a pit and to prison to ascension to the, to the right hand of a pharaoh. He's gone from humiliation to exaltation. Why? All for the purpose in God's plan for Joseph to become a source of bread and a source of life for the nations and saving the entire world from death. And if that doesn't sound familiar, I don't know what does. Because the reality is, it sounds familiar because the Joseph story here points forward to an even greater, more ultimate rags to riches story, the story of Jesus. Let, just as Joseph was imprisoned in Egypt, so Jesus was imprisoned in a tomb. And just as Joseph was liberated from prison and exalted to the right hand of Pharaoh to rule as king over Egypt, so Jesus was liberated from the grave and exalted to the right hand of God, the Father, to rule over the world. And just as everyone in Egypt was commanded to bow the knee to Joseph, so every knee will one day bow before Jesus. And just as Joseph with bread saved many people from death. So Jesus, the bread of life, saves all those who trust in him by faith from eternal death. This then, like put, connect all the dots here. This then, right here at this moment, is why this story is especially relevant and applicable for everyone here this morning who isn't a Christian. Like if that's you, then don't miss what's being offered to you in this story, in this passage here this morning. Like you, you may or, or may not realize this, but there's something coming in your life that's a whole lot more, that's a whole lot worse than an earthly famine. And that something that's coming is eternal death. It's eternal judgment. It's eternal death. Like that's what you deserve for your sin and your rebellion against God. You deserve to die and live under God's wrath and judgment forever in an unending world of, of, 
of conscious torment. But just like God exalted Joseph to save and rescue the world from a deadly famine by giving them bread, so God did the same thing with Jesus by exalting Jesus to save and rescue the world, to save and rescue you by giving you his life. That he sent Jesus to this earth to die the death that you deserve for your sin by dying on a cross in your place and conquering death by rising back to life three days later and then being exalted by God to, to God's right hand as King of kings and Lord of lords. And now Jesus is offering his death, is offering his resurrection to you as your one and only hope of being saved and rescued from the death that's to come. So then, just like the nations then came to Joseph in Egypt to be saved and rescued from a deadly famine, like my appeal to you this morning, if you're a Christian then, is to come to Jesus right now to be saved and rescued from, the, from death for all of eternity. And the way that you do that is by trusting him. It's by believing in him. It's by placing your faith and believing and trusting that his death on the cross and his victorious resurrection is your one and only hope for being saved and rescued from the eternal death that you deserve for your sins. That your one and only hope is Jesus. That he's your bread of eternal life. And so then it's, this, it's in this way then that this passage, this story here this morning is applicable and relevant for, for everyone that's here, no matter where you find yourself. That for those of you who are here this morning, you've been forgotten or feel forgotten because of the cross of Jesus. If you're a Christian, Jesus remembers you and will never forget you. For those who feel like your life is spinning out of control, it's not out of control. God has everything fixed. It's in complete control. And for those who are in desperate need of wisdom, look to Jesus as your wisdom. Trust Jesus' wisdom. Listen to his wisdom. Follow his wisdom. Not anybody else's, his wisdom. And for those who aren't Christians here this morning, trust and believe in Jesus and receive him as, as the bread for eternal life. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that um, even in accounts and stories that we've heard over and over again and happened hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of years ago, that your word is living and active, that it even speaks to our lives today and where we find ourselves today. And so in the midst of how this passage speaks personally to these different groups that we've mentioned here this morning. Lord, you know what each person here needs to hear, what they need to be reminded of, what they need to be encouraged by, what they need to find their hope in, what they need to be convicted by. And you know how best to apply and to cause this passage to come to bear on their lives. And so God, I pray that you would do that ultimately to that end, or that you would encourage, that you would comfort, that you would convict, that you would give hope however you see fit. And that most of all, that we would leave here rejoicing and glorifying in the new and greater Joseph that you have brought to us, the wise one, the discerning one, who is raised from a grave, seated at your right hand, to save and rescue the whole world, all those who, those who come and trust in him from the death that we deserve. Praise Jesus. It's in his name we pray these things. Amen.